Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, appreciate you braving this tent uh, to, to join us to, to have a conversation about the revitalization of the city of Detroit. I'm Benjamin Kennedy. I'm a senior program officer at the Kresge Foundation. Um, before I get into the particulars of our conversation today, I'm just going to tell you a little bit of why I'm, I'm up here moderating this panel. Uh, the Kresge Foundation is a large national foundation. Um, we do work in cities all over the country and are committed to expanding opportunities in America's cities. Uh, we call Detroit our hometown. It's been our hometown for almost 90 years. We are deeply committed to the city, and we frankly think it's some of the most innovative and creative work being done in community development in this country right now. Um, I, uh, I'm fortunate to have three of, of those innovative, creative folks uh, here with me today to maybe give you a, a bit of a glimpse, as, as, most, as best as we can in, in just an hour, um, into, into what's going on on the ground in Detroit. Uh, you know, my sense, sort of traveling the country, talking to people about, about Detroit, is that people sort of are familiar with two broad, well-known narratives. Uh, one is the Detroit is dead narrative, right? So it's just a you know, series of disasters culminating in this bankruptcy, which is the final nail in the coffin. Well-worn, you know, hackneyed narrative. The other is a very positive narrative, but it's a sort of silver bullet booster narrative that some billionaire foundation or some other institution is going to single-handedly change and save Detroit. Um, you know, there are elements of truth in, in both of these narratives, uh, you know, but, but my sense is that, that actually what's going on on the ground is, is far more complex, really far more interesting, far more dynamic than those two narratives would suggest. So, uh, with that little bit of preamble, the way we're gonna we're gonna go today here is we're gonna I'm gonna ask each of each of the panelists just to, to introduce themselves and describe a little bit about what they do, what their organizations do in the context of Detroit's revitalization, um, and then we're just gonna cycle through you know three big categories of discussion. The first is kind of dimensioning the challenges in Detroit, dimensioning the problems. Uh, the second is talking a bit about the solutions and some of the the innovative of things going on on, on the ground uh, in Detroit. And then third, we're going we're gonna to kind of think a little bit about the future of the city and, and, and try to look forward a bit to, to what the city might look like coming out of bankruptcy and over, over the long term. And then, of course, we'll make, make sure there's plenty of time, about 15 minutes at the end of this session, so that all of you can join the conversation and ask questions. So with that, I will begin at the end uh, with, with Scott Sporty. So, Scott, why don't you introduce yourself, please? Hello, I'm Scott Sporty with NCB Capital Impact. We are a large national community development financial institution based in Washington, D.C., with a major office here in Oakland, and uh, until recently have really not focused a lot on place, but instead have focused most of our lending efforts on specific market sectors like healthcare, education, affordable housing. And Detroit presented us with an opportunity, actually an invitation to join the other people on this panel uh, as really our first major significant place-based economic development initiative. And uh, we've been working on that now for three years. We're moving into the second phase. Uh, we're really excited, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as we move into the panel. Leslie. Hi, I'm Leslie Smith. Um, I'm the president and CEO of Tech Town, which is an accelerator located in Midtown Detroit, which focuses on two pretty interesting um, things. One is technology-based economic development movement of intellectual property to market, which is not terribly innovative in and of itself. But the second is really the movement of acceleration strategies into the creation of place and place-based businesses in the city of Detroit, and really bringing the base economy that occurs with the creation of new tech startups with the creation of new place based startups together to start to create an expanded economy which offers opportunities for employment but also products and services that start to create a more vibrant city in and around the midtown and broader neighborhoods. Sue? Um, my name is Sue Mosey and I'm the president of Midtown Detroit Inc. and we're a community development and planning agency for uh, the neighborhood that's just north of the downtown 
that houses our major museums, our university, our two major healthcare centers, um, a lot of big social agencies, your typical kind of you know, civic corridor. Uh, the work that we do is really um, revolves around a lot of real estate and planning activities, small business development activities, infrastructure, uh, sort of community building, uh, large arts programming. So we do a lot of um, pretty broad set of work around place and really try and look at all the different um, uh, supports and programs that need to be there to sort of move the whole neighborhood revitalization. Uh, agenda forward in the neighborhood, and we work closely with all three of the other panelists here, uh, with Scott on deploying capital that's raised nationally and locally for a lot of the efforts in the neighborhood, and Leslie as our TA provider for a lot of our small business development, and Kresge as a funder and also a partner in some other national initiatives. That's great. So thanks all. So uh, let's just begin again with dimensioning the challenges of Detroit, right? So there, there, this is a, a set of, of complex and messy and, and interconnected problems, um, and we could probably tick off uh, quite a number. But I'm going to ask each of our panelists just to, to provide two or three of the, the really big, hairy challenges facing uh, Detroit right now. So Sue, why don't, why don't we start with you and, and tell us what you think two or three big challenges are right now. Well, I mean, I've been working, doing community development work in Detroit for about 35 years and 26 in this particular geography, so I have a long horizon, I think, over, um, you know, what's really happened in terms of the infrastructure there. And, you know, I still feel that the biggest um, uh, challenge has been for Detroit is really the rise of a lot of really... Um, uh, strong leadership in a wide variety of the sectors. So, you know, starting with our mayoral leadership for many, many decades, and then that impacts all of your senior governmental leadership, and then eventually has an impact on your local uh, neighborhood leadership, because the system in Detroit has struggled for many, many years, I think due to a lot of lack of capacity to really take advantage of the remarkable opportunities that exist in Detroit. I mean, Detroit's got a gorgeous river, it's got a beautiful Olmstead Park, some of the best architecture in its downtown, uh, high quality, you know, legacy arts and cultural, you know, major urban universities, Carnegie One Research uh, facilities, I mean, it's got a huge amount of iconic um, infrastructure there, but it has not been leveraged um, in the face of a lot of the um, loss of the job space over the years to reposition it in other strong employment areas. So that's been a huge challenge. I think you'll probably hear, you probably hear a lot or read a lot about how um, much of the work in Detroit now has really fallen to many of the other sectors to really um, move forward, whether it is philanthropy or local leadership. Um, but it's very, very difficult to scale uh, redevelopment in a large city without that, you know, intrinsic infrastructure being in place. So that's one challenge. Um, you know, we continue to chal be challenged, I think, in terms of the capital stacking. Scott will talk more about that. Um, but because we don't yet have values built, even in the center city, which is by far uh, the, the area of the city that's experiencing a, a really robust comeback at this point, benefiting from a lot of national trends like all the rest of the cities are. Um, but we aren't quite to the point where we've built the values to where a lot of financial subsidy is not required. And so, you know, that continues to be a challenge, I think, for all of us doing work in the city is just simply having the proper level of resources for people to be successful, whether you're a small business operator or you're a housing developer. Great, want me to go next? So um, I think Sue makes a really great point about this uh, political leadership and decades of kind of a, a lack of courage and bold thinking around that leadership, which, you know, clearly has some kind of macro orientation to some of the problems we have. On a really kind of tactical level, though, that affects the work we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and while some of the story in the narrative about Detroit is, you know, an open landscape and is a great place to create and make your own opportunities, while that's true, 
There is this kind of wall that we ultimately hit when the infrastructure fails to meet the needs of the new business owners and the development that is occurring or the residential folks that have decided to move in and dig in. And our failure to address this challenge long term, I think will continue to limit us and our ability to really exploit this interest and enthusiasm and in, in the opportunities that exist in Detroit by the kind of hard cold reality of those limits, right? And, and some of those limits are about safety, security, lighting, the basic kind of, you know, public infrastructure that many of us take for granted that has to be solved if we're going to ultimately thrive in this organic development opportunity. Second, which is an interesting th thing to think about, is something I've been dealing with over the last five or six years in Detroit, was just a restoration of the entrepreneurial culture and a willingness to take risk and thrive in that risk environment. It would seem a natural place for us to live and be, given our automotive roots and the fact that Henry Ford and others kind of created their entire careers and, and an industry upon which we thrived for 100 years. But moving people to a place of willingness to invest in that entrepreneurial culture and move themselves to a point of risk after having lost those, those very stable employment circumstances that they enjoyed for so many decades has been a real challenge for us. And, and as we exit kind of a retraining of an entire generation of people, we're starting to see the intergenerational opportunities where the young folks that are coming to the city anew are engaging with the folks that have been there a longer amount of time, and you're starting to see a, a new developing belief in that, in that um, adventure and, and opportunity as kind of economic replacement. And so those two things, I think, have been um, our biggest challenges and opportunities, frankly. Our challenges are really the, the challenges of capital. And when, when we came into Detroit about three and a half years ago, uh, that was a time when, when banks weren't lending at all. And we came in and worked with an existing pipeline of transactions that had been stuck for 12, 24, 36 months because banks had committed to them and pulled out or they were unable to assemble the capital. And it's, it is the challenge of having to raise 18 levels of structured debt in order to get a single project done. And that's hugely inefficient. Things get done, but it takes forever, and it takes too much brain power on the part of people like Sue and, and Benji and Leslie here. And um, the, we came in to try to bring the scale that we had to unstick stuck transactions. So now a few years later, we came in with the tools that weren't quite right for what we wanted to accomplish. We came in with uh, uh, capital from traditional financial institutions. It wasn't priced well. It had a fairly short term. And we're trying to overcome a challenge that you wouldn't imagine is a challenge, but actually, where we're, where we're basing most of our work, there's about a 93% occupancy rate in rental housing. And if you pick up Time Magazine or any other traditional media piece about Detroit, no one is going to show you a photograph of a neighborhood in Detroit that has 93% occupancy. They're going to show you the train station or one of those neighborhoods where grass is growing in the middle of an abandoned house. But unfortunately, that image of Detroit is the image that investors see. So when you try to bring an outside investor into Detroit, sight unseen essentially, their image of what they're investing in is the prairie. And instead, we're bringing them into a vibrant community and we're trying to expand in concentric circles out from the place where people want to be. So the challenge we have right now is really the one that the cost of a project exceeds the value that an appraiser is going to give to it. And uh, that's just sort of the economic fact, despite the fact that, that the building has 100% occupancy, it has a waiting list 50 people long, it's still being appraised at a 1995 valuation. And it, you just can't finance a project that way, and hence the need for 18 different sources of capital that have made it work. So what we're doing right now is sort of a second iteration, bringing in investors that aren't afraid to bring capital into Detroit, adding in a layer of subordinate debt that's important and some subsidized capital, but it's only two layers. And that should, we hope, be the single solution to many of these projects. And, and we hope to build from there to help projects happen more consistently and more predictably and make better use of the subsidy that's available. That's great, thanks. Um, you know, what I think is interesting, and I promise you, uh, we, didn't, we didn't 
uh, I didn't prep them earlier, but I think what's really interesting about that sort of list that, that's just been compiled is you, you have actually uh, a set of issue areas or problems that, are, uh, that, that easily translate to, to other sort of revitalization efforts across the country and elsewhere actually in, in the world. Um, you've got the issue of, of sort of weak public sector leadership um, or, or inconsistent public sector leadership. You've got private market dislocations and other kind of basic market failures. You've got uh, limited infrastructure, city services, etc. So you've got essentially a weak enabling environment. Uh, a a mono-economy and the sort of inverse of that is a lack of sort of economic diversification and, and new uh, venture creation. Um, just lack of capital and lack of the right type of capital. And then the last piece that I think Scott was talking about is sort of the delta between perceived risk and actual risk right. um, that's sort of working against uh, bringing new capital and new players to the city. I think that's a fantastic list. I think the obvious question is, well, what about the thing everyone's reading about right now? Is the bankruptcy not a big challenge? So, Sue, is the bankruptcy a big challenge or not? Well, I think most people in Detroit, quite frankly, view it as an opportunity more than a challenge. I mean, Detroit's been dealing with this, you know, sort of accounting uh, tricks every year for, you know, decades and decades. I mean, everyone's known sooner or later the, the population loss, the tax bank loss, the strategy of just raising taxes on all the survivors that have stayed, the businesses and the, and the folks, the, the, the really dedicated folks that have stayed and want to be part of the rebuild is not a sustainable economic frame for coming back and taking care of the basic city services needed in Detroit. So most people feel like, you know, now's an opportunity. Let's figure it out. Let's start over with a, with an, a new kind of economic frame for the city and how it can deliver the, the services to its citizens that they deserve and they're paying for through their taxes. And for those of us who I think do, are doing the revitalization work, um, it's also a good thing because, again, for those of us who are working to get businesses started, get residents moving in, we also need to be able to give them insurances that their investments in the city are going to be, you know, ones that, um, you know, they can rely on longer term. So it really takes away a lot of the uncertainties and concerns, I think, going forward, provided that the new, that between the emergency manager is a short term and the next mayor, uh, which will have a new mayor in January. So taking, you know, you know, assuming that we're going to get folks in that are going to really be able to leverage this time and this opportunity for this full restructure and relook, um, in especially as it relates to the new city plan that was done, uh, which is a citywide plan that pretty much everyone now has signed on to. So there's a roadmap. So you combine the new roadmap that's based on a lot of data and and community engagement, and you combine it with a full restructure and new leadership, I mean, there's potential there that this could be a game changer for Detroit going forward. Leslie, what, what about you? I mean, uh, you, you interact with a lot of entrepreneurs. Are they, do they even think about the notion of, of Detroit in bankruptcy versus Detroit not in bankruptcy? It's an interesting question, and uh, I hadn't even paid attention to the fact that none of us listed it until you highlighted it, because I feel like it's almost everybody else's news, even though it's about us, because we've been living in that kind of pre-bankruptcy space for so long um, with you know a, a deficit public sector that we've all kind of worked to create solutions around. And for us, as well as our, our client base, I think they see the opportunity as having a new partner in the game, so a third partner beyond you know the private and philanthropic partners that already exist. As a real upside, and so I think we've learned to live in the deficit situation and adding a functioning public sector can only be perceived as adding new value. And I think that's how entrepreneurs see it. That's how we certainly see it. I look at this as an opportunity to have a productive, vibrant partner in the work that today doesn't exist. Scott, you guys aren't even based in Detroit. Surely, some, surely someone on your board said, Detroit? Thank you. <laughs> 
more than one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the challenge is, does come from mostly from the outsiders, and it's uh, attempting to, to raise capital from outside investors who probably somewhere in their corporate level are standing to lose money on Detroit-backed bonds. And uh, again, they're coming back to an image where they believe that the city functioned in some way before that actually made a difference to the deals that we do. And it doesn't. Uh, hasn't. And we hope we see this as an opportunity for the city to truly become functional again and actually contribute to the public. Sue, for example, she installs their own street lights. It, that, what kind of city requires a community development corporation to install their own infrastructure to make their neighborhood work? Sue, let's pick up on the image issue, because I think this is something that you've been working on for a while with, in, in Midtown. So talk a little bit about, you know, going back even 10, 15 years, sort of the, the, the overnight success, the overnight 15-year success that is, that is Midtown Detroit and how it's shifted the image of a place. Yeah, I mean, I think both Midtown and Downtown have unique... Uh, revitalization efforts that have been at work for quite some time. They've been sustained over quite a long period by organizations that have had some resources and capacity um, uh, going forward. So the, um, but you know, clearly, you know, 20, 25 years ago, you know, people, no one was really looking seriously as making much of an investment in Detroit. I mean, whether it was out in the neighborhoods or it was really in the downtown. There were, of course, your few really committed uh, corporate folks that came from Detroit, and so there were always going to be a few of those. Um, but probably 10, maybe 10 years ago, things started, you know, before the bust, Things started really picking up a lot of speed, as they did in many other markets, but uh, in Detroit as well, around um, people really beginning to view uh, that Detroit was finally benefiting from national trends and younger demographics, and people who are not like caught into that, you know, same old frame where you know we're really proud that. You know, nobody in my family has been down to the city of Detroit for 30 years. You know, I mean, that's what you used to hear in the suburban metro districts, like over and over again. Today, you're much more frequently going to hear, well, you know, I hear there's some really good stuff going on there. Uh, you know, we went down there and explored that new river walk. You know, we went down there and participated and went shopping at all these little boutiques and restaurants that have opened up. So it really has changed. Um, a lot of the folks' image that, that reside in the, uh, in the suburban districts. And it's taken a long, long time. And they, you know, quite frankly, they had to see physical, visible evidence that things were changing. You know, for a lot of times, you know, Detroit would just be out there with, I mean, we were always about the Silver Bullet Project, you know? It was always about the Renson or the new arena or whatever. You know, people just don't buy that. Um, and, and they understand that that's not necessarily giving them the package of urban lifestyle they're looking for. Um, but today you can come down to that corridor and there's enough of it now that's there. It's not fully developed, but there's enough that's there that people now can see um, where the city core is going. And everybody has jumping back on board now. So Detroit's a very iconic city. And many, many people have come through Detroit or come from Detroit. And there's a lot of allegiance even nationally to that city. So, you know, you give people an opening and you can demonstrate that, you know, Detroit's getting its act together and it's really redeveloping appropriately. It's amazing how quickly media and lots of uh, um, uh, folks in the surrounding uh, areas and throughout the state have really turned, um, you know, are really talking a whole different conversation about Detroit today. Give us an example. Um, well, I mean, I'd say there's all sorts of people that I talk to all the time that come into Detroit. You know, I heard about, I was reading an article, I mean, constantly. I was reading an article about all this really interesting work being done in Detroit. I have relatives that live in Detroit. I mean, this is like classic. I have relatives that live in Bloomfield Hills, which is a very affluent, you know, <laughs> neighbor in Detroit. It always goes that way. And I want to, you know, because of everything I'm reading and it sounds like there's really good values and interesting work, I want to come there and make an investment. I mean, I cannot tell you how many of those emails I get, I get a week. And these are people who actually do come there and look for investment opportunities and many have invested. So, the, you know, the narrative is the first door that has to, the first thing that has to change 
to even get these people in the, you know, in the door to, to really searching for the right opportunity. Um, but there's lots of those stories out there every day. So these Detroit. people land, they, they come knocking on your door. They say, Sue Mosey sent me Usually. over here, and they said, you're going to help me start a business in Detroit. So give, give us some examples of, of folks you've worked with, particularly dynamic uh, sort of new entrepreneurs in, in Detroit. Yeah, I mean, I think what's really cool about Detroit um, at this moment in time is that over the course of that 15-year overnight success, we've built an image of opportunity for those who think outside of the box. So a city that once was so insular and siloed in its very behaviors is now perceived as this really complex and dynamic opportunity. And so the folks that we see at TechTown who are interested in starting businesses in the city of Detroit are not your average entrepreneurs, right? And so they want to start something that's new and interesting and different and really start to create a place that is expressive of their interests. And, and those are primarily a younger group of folks that are moving into this experience, which is good in terms of the residential stock and the, and the commercial opportunity. It also creates enhanced walkability and, and things that we all know are good. I think Sue makes a really good point about the, the perspective of time, though, because I do think that as we start to imagine the impacts that have occurred in the downtown and midtown beyond the downtown and midtown, which is where many of these entrepreneurs are starting to think they'd like to go. How can I move out into one of the neighborhoods of the city? We have to really think about solving some of the problems that, that Sue and others have solved in the midtown and downtown that are not yet solved in the neighborhoods. And the beautiful opportunity for us, I think, is that We've now modeled, tested, and tried a whole number of innovative solutions that we're working together now to expand out into the neighborhoods in really targeted ways, which will allow you know, folks at TechTown to move new entrepreneurs with intention into safe places, not only within the Midtown, but also starting beyond the Midtown. Because I think one of the knocks that you'll regularly hear, and if we allow you to ask the question you may ask, is, you know, what about the rest of the city? And, and I will say that this roadmap that Sue talked about, the Detroit Future Cities roadmap, and, and how we're going to expand that healing beyond the corridor is very real and prescient for all of us. And the lessons we've learned will help us do that. The caution is that this took 25 years. Mm -hmm. Right? And so this is a, a long-term engagement that we're all committing to. And entrepreneurs get that. They're kind of ripe and ready for that experience, which is why I think this, this startup culture is really good as we expand our, our vision and version. And Leslie, you, you all at TechTown have rolled out a really cool program that seeks to do exactly this, begin to migrate some of this great entrepreneurial energy from the core out to neighborhoods. Can you talk just a little bit about, about that program? Sure. I mean, I think it became real clear to us when we had kind of repeated visitors to Tech Town say, you know, this is all great and we love the work that you're doing here. Um, what, how can we move this into the neighborhoods? How can we translate this into the neighborhoods? Because remember, I mean, 70% of the jobs that are occupied in the city of Detroit are still occupied by people from outside of the mm -hmm. Detroit. The small business ownership is still, you know, less than 10% African American owned in a city that's 83% African. American. And so there's a real, you know, economic imbalance that exists there and, and a failure to kind of address social equity and small business uh, and enterprise creation. And so our program was really designed to take the acceleration and development strategies that have worked so well in the midtown and downtown into neighborhoods with a couple kind of key elements at play. One, we don't show up and say, ha ha, we have the answers for you. We actually ask, you know, what does a healthy, vibrant neighborhood look like to you and engage with the neighborhood to ask those questions and then bring to bear this suite of tools and resources that we've developed in partnership with dozens of organizations across the city and region to start to build that version of community for them. And so, you know, Sue and I are currently working in a, in a very large neighborhood uh, called Brightmoor in Detroit, which has suffered disinvestment for 60 years and is really trying to figure out how do we make a comeback. And the answer is you can make a comeback, but we have to do it in very targeted and thoughtful, intentional ways, and the process will be long. And 
if, we're, if you're honest and bring that conversation to the neighborhoods with integrity, I think you get really um, productive partners that exist within the neighborhood who are, who are thoughtful and, and engaged in the process. One of the challenges that exists in the city is this whole suburb city thing that has occurred over the course of the last you know, 100 years. And so Bloomfield Hills really isn't the city of Detroit, and there's some very kind of strong negative feelings about that. The work that we get to do in the neighborhood starts to heal that negativity and bring economic opportunity to the neighborhoods, and, and that's just really important if we're going to heal on the whole. You know, what, one thing uh, that, that we always say at the Kresge Foundation when we think about uh, sort of strengthening this, the city vis-a-vis -vis the, the suburbs is, is that you really need to, to focus on the city itself. And so we, we uh, pretty intentionally invest within the city limits at, at, at Kresge. Um, but as we sort of you know, evolve our, our, our strategy and our thinking about, about how we remake and reconstitute a place, we, we begin to realize that, that, you know, it can't just be about working in the corridor, aiming at individuals of a certain demographic. That's certainly where you got to start. But then you have to sort of translate and migrate to new geographies and also to new demographics, right? And you got to have families. You got to aim at kids, um, and so Scott, you, you've you've been involved in some of that work mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of financing charter schools and, and the like. So, you know, what, what's your, what's your sense of the possibilities that exist with respect to creating a Detroit that uh, uh, serves families well, not just individuals? Well, I think you point to a really uh, key challenge that we have right now because this cannot be uh, an economic development strategy built on coffee bars and yoga. It has to be. It has to be more about making sure that families want to come to Detroit and stay in Detroit. And it's it's easy when you're single, recently married, to find yourself a cool place, live in the city for a while, enjoy the amenities of the city, and then move out to suburbia at some point because you, you're concerned about schools or safety or the other issues. And that's really the key issue that we need to be focused on here. And I think there is some opportunity as we're seeing high-performing, mostly charter schools and some magnet schools start to attract kids from outside of the city and within the city. Um, it's really built along a nice corridor of area, good, uh, bringing a number of students into this part of Detroit. It's the beginnings of the kind of amenity that people are expecting for their own kids. And a lot of times what we're seeing is people who live in the suburbs, who work in downtown Detroit, they're bringing their kids into a school in Detroit because it's close to the parents' office. And we hope at some point that will help bring the parents to actually live in the city once they get a little comfortable with the concept that there actually are really nice places to live in the city of Detroit. Uh, but I think we really do need to focus on making them feel safe, making them feel like there are many, there are options. There's healthcare nearby, there's workforce housing readily available. This, this cannot be about attracting the upper income, highly mobile individual because it's not gonna last, it won't stick. So, you know, Sue, the, the interesting thing is that Midtown, and even to some extent increasingly downtown, our central business district are safe and uh, in some ways provide the, the services that families need, and, and certainly Midtown has a ton of schools and early childhood system, et cetera. Um, but, you know, historically, people just don't associate Midtown and Downtown with residential family living. Um, you're working to change that, I think, but talk a little bit about how you get people to sort of see a different sort of mix of uses in the, in the core, uh, you know, relative to what, what they've experienced in the past. Um, well, I think we're trying to do a lot of different things because it is very frustrating sometimes when you do have really um, high-performing schools in your area, but it, they're still not acting as an attractor for people. It's like they're sort of discounted because they're in the city. And, um, you know, anytime you have a really high-quality amenity, you really want to be able to use it as part of your attraction strategy. So it is, it is one of those areas that I think we continually struggle with trying to leverage appropriately. But, you know, green space, public spaces, that's a big thing. Um, you know, our area was not built with, you know, any kind of real infrastructure much for public spaces, very small, uh, little park at parks, but not anything of scale, really. Um, and I think that sort of is an issue that we have to continue to work on for families. Um, you know, it's becoming a much more bicycle-friendly and pedestrian-friendly environment. Clearly, that's important uh, for families, and I think that has helped us to attract around some of these anchor schools uh, families back to the district. 
Uh, where we're really seeing some um, growth there is in some of the workforce housing areas and developments that we have, where a lot of those folks are working at the medical complexes or the universities or others, um, other positions, and they have kids, and they really do want to be able to walk to work. And we've also put together an um, incentive program, uh, which is a residential incentive program uh, that's funded for about $10 million by a whole group of funders to incentivize people to move back to the downtown and midtown and some of the adjacent neighborhoods around the core. Um, and that's done a tremendous amount in terms of changing, I think, people's narrative about the city and the opportunities. And we've attracted a good number of families uh, back to the neighborhood because a lot of the geography is really close to these big institutions that have really strong security and police forces and you know, have, have uh, the basic amenities in place for families. Let, let, let's return to uh, public sector leadership for a moment. So, you know, we, we talked about a lack of, of uh, strength in the local sort of uh, civic leadership and public sector leadership in particular. But the, the state and, and the federal government actually play a key role in Detroit. And, and each of you has interactions with both of those levels of government and different agencies, et cetera. So why don't, why don't we just actually start with Scott and just go on down the line. But I mean, how, how, how would you imagine the federal government in particular, and, and to some extent the state government, uh, to the degree you have in, uh, a lot of interactions with them, how would you imagine them playing differently at this moment in time in, in Detroit? And, and, or, or what do you think they're doing right, or, or maybe not getting right? I think there are, are, are a couple of answers to that. I think one is that people working in Detroit need to change their assumption that because they're in Detroit, they're entitled to a greater share or a, a share of federal resources. They need to show that there's a reason why the federal government needs to invest in the city. And I think um, uh, there have been a lot of proposals that have been very attractive um, or have, have seemed on the face of it to be attractive, but they have basically laid out there, this is Detroit, we deserve it. And I think there needs to be a little bit more um, thoughtfulness, a little more scale to sort of back that up. And I think that's been one of the challenges in some of the larger federal programs recently. And then the other challenge is the, the apparent reality that a lot of federal funds are, go through the city of Detroit and they seem to just sort of disappear or get stuck there. So the city itself or government itself needs to be able to create some sort of infrastructure to make sure the money gets to where it was intended to go in the first place because sooner or later the federal government is just going to give up sending that kind of resource this way. What do you think, Leslie? Yeah, I would say from the Fed's perspective, that's certainly been our experience, that they a, perceive a sense of entitlement in a lot of the proposals they get from the city, especially in the kind of innovation economy stuff. We've gotten that feedback repeatedly. We've been successful in getting some capital deployed in our district through HUD and um, and. That's been really productive for us. Our stronger relationship has been with the state, who has repeatedly, increasingly stepped up and filled the gap uh, that the city has left in terms of funding and support for um, economic development, either in the in the place-based economy or the innovation-based economy. And the city has has failed to kind of participate in in that work at least productively, and the, the state has always kind of been there. I think the concern, um, and you mentioned a little bit what you know I think of as funder fatigue from the feds. If you can't deploy the funds we've given you, why should we give you more? Or if you can't be effective and efficient at that deployment, then why should we give you more? I think the state really would like to have a partner in that work because they also don't want to be the sole kind of agency on the hook for everything that has to happen in the city. And so we see a bit of pushback from the state about wanting to fund entire programs or continue to fund programs that they've funded over a, a long period of time. So I think we have some work to do in convincing them to stay in the game longer. Philanthropy has filled a lot of those gaps, and I know you didn't ask about that specifically, but for the grace of philanthropy and filling out the capital stack, much of this work, if not most of it, would not have occurred. And so I think, um, you know, the, the state and the feds have been partners, not necessarily always willing, and would like to see a, a reduced role or at least a different role. And I think, you know, new city leadership can help us get there. 
Yeah. What's your experience been, Sue? Um, I think Detroit, generally, we've had good experience in a couple of the federal areas. One would certainly be transportation funds, um, you know, Tiger grants and all sorts of enhancement grants. And I mean, those are dollars that flow through the state and the city that, um, you know, there, there's always, you know, lots of good non-motorized and greenway trails and park developments. and. Um, there's lots of activity on the ground in those kinds of projects because, again, those aren't the ones that are dependent necessarily on a market uh, dynamic. So um, that's been, I think, where we've probably had the most success with, with uh, federal funding. HUD has been a huge challenge. I mean, HUD has been in trying to fix the HUD problems in Detroit for the last three years. And, um, you know, at this point, uh, the emergency manager announced that they're going to bring in a, an outside grants management company to just try to help move the $300 million worth of annual funds that come to Detroit out into all the different program areas that they need to go. So for all of us who put projects together, who really have gaps that should be filled by a lot of those dollars, they have not been accessible to folks. Um, in any consistent way for many, many years. And so that's, you know, um, certainly been problematic. I agree the state has stepped up um, in, you know, trying to strategically partner uh, on the ground around certain areas of place-based work, and that certainly helps some. Um, but you, again, it's just like you really need a city with a mayor that is going to be effective. You need HUD to be effective in your city as a partner as well. And we're not doing very well on either of those right now. So before we, we uh, take questions from the floor, let me just ask one more question of, of, of each of you. So let's just, you know, look out 10 years, look out 20 years. Um, and I get actually asked this, this question quite a bit. Um, so what are you aiming for? Um, and I don't care if you talk about your specific kind of corner of the world, district or sector, or if you talk about the city as a whole, but what's the end game here in Detroit? What, what, what are we trying to create 20 years from now? Scott? <laughs> we came into Detroit trying to do deals, trying to get transactions done, get them done as quickly and effectively and efficiently as we could. I think right now what we're turning ourselves into seeing is being able to show that we are actually creating a hub of development, bringing thousands of people into a part of the city and from there radiating out. And with the type of financing that we're assembling, the, the work that we're doing here that's really focused more on making a change in the neighborhood, changing the spirit of the neighborhood, and not just about getting the next deal done. I see in 10, 15 years from now, we're going to have a whole different city, a whole different situation than we have right now. So five years ago, I would have answered that question differently, and, and it would have had a lot more to do with you know, a technology-based economy and you know, all of the hope and promise that exists there. Today, I answer that question by saying the Detroit, I imagine, 20 years from now has Economic, oppor economic opportunities for people of all race, ethnicity, gender, and age, because I don't see that in all places today in my city. And I'd like to see a economically sustainable, at least certain you know, swaths of the city have sort of an economically sustainable model going, uh, whereby people are accessing jobs and also being able to provide the purchasing power, um, attracting and providing some of the residential base back into the city uh, that's necessary for any of the work I think that all of us are trying to do to ever really work long term with a functional, scaled city government, federal partners, um, because ultimately I think that's what's going to be able to move Detroit from uh, you know, the constantly struggling, battling on all sides to something that's just um, going to begin to be able to operate like under a normal set of parameters like most other cities. Um, and there's still, you know, a good decade or two's worth of work to get to that kind of a plateau, I think. All right, well, 
now it's your turn, have at us. And uh, I, I think we have two microphones, and all I would ask is that you just wait till you have a microphone to speak so that we can pick you up on the live feed. Okay. I'm Risa Jenkins, I'm with the CED Group and MIT Forum Board. I was in Detroit recently, and there was a group that I met with called the Youth City Planning Group. And you mentioned that there's a city plan that everybody is signed off on, which is rare. So how did that happen in the face of such poor city leadership? You want to you talk wanna... about Detroit Future City? Well, yeah, I can talk a little bit about it. So the, um, uh, you know, due to, to really the fact that Detroit had so many different single planning exercises going on around the city and there really being uh, nothing that was really um, connecting them or prioritizing where investments should be made or really trying to leverage opportunities or to just really take a look at the huge landmass uh, that Detroit is and trying to figure out a roadmap to, you know, where can uh, investments and what types, given different typologies in different neighborhoods, like what makes sense in a neighborhood that clearly isn't economically going to come back? But what, what sort of uh, interventions could be made in a neighborhood like that that improves still quality of life for folks that still are going to be there? Uh, what are you going to do in terms of the corridors, the six economic corridors of the city where there is economic still functioning and where there's potential that these corridors have you know, job centers along them, and how are you going to connect them to the neighborhoods where people who are unemployed are still living, and really taking a look at the transit uh, corridor models. And before there was a lot of one-off, you know, like everybody was doing their own thing in the city, and there wasn't any way for like a funder like a Kresge or even the, a HUD to come in and say, look, uh, we, we don't know, we want to invest in Detroit. I don't know how many times I've heard that. We want to invest in Detroit, but we don't know where or what or what's going to be impactful or what's going to work. So three years were really spent, uh, funded by Kresge and Ford Foundation, other foundations, to really have a huge community citywide engagement program. That's why it took so long um, to make sure this really bubbled up from all these different neighborhoods and sectors to create something that, in the end, everybody pretty much has signed off on as being, this is the plan. Um, and when people now are going and looking at uh, asking for funding for different parts, pilot projects or infrastructure investments, you, you better be able to defend in this plan that this really is a um, investment that makes sense given what everyone's working together to try to achieve in the city. So it gives a, the important frame now that we really have never had there to make more informed decisions and decisions that the community all really rallied around together. Yeah, it's uh, DetroitFutureCity.org. Yeah. Hello, I'm James Wallace from the Kellogg Foundation. Hi. I'm a lifelong resident of Detroit, um, so I I have a vested interest in this discussion. Uh, what are some of the specifics, the specific efforts to address hidden costs in the city, such as insurance rates, uh, residential property tax, utility rates, those kind of costs? Um, I will say that, of course, as you may be aware, the state came in and took a look at the city assessments and was mortified with what was going on, with assessment on residential values, and opened up for tons of appeals that are being made right now, and believe me, all sorts of people are going in for appeals. Um, again, this was really a strategy that the city was employing to just squeeze the, the few people that were, that were still there and the new people coming in to sort of make up for all this other deficit issues that the city is facing, which you know can't ever really work. So I think you are gonna see some action taken on the state's part Working with, working with the city assessor's department to rectify some of this property tax problem. Insurance rates, I'm gonna be clear, are a huge problem. Mm -hmm. Huge problem. And um, we still continue, I mean, I, I have residence owners that call me, that tell me stories like, you know, I have no idea why, but my residential insurance rate doubled in one year. For no, you know, no claims, no, I mean, just crazy stuff. I mean, it's really out of control. And that whole insurance issue, there has to be some rationale 
that's eventually brought to that. That is just for people considering investing in the tr Detroit or living there is got to be one of the top couple issues for people. So there isn't really a good strategy yet on that. Um, politicians constantly talk about how critical it is to come up with some kind of a uh, strategy to deal with that, but it is a really, really big issue out there. Great question. Okay, I think we've got one right here. Yep. Hi, um, Lisa Lillalone with Mango Networks, a native of Michigan. So my heart is with you and I'm cheering for Detroit. I think there's a tremendous opportunity in Detroit with the real estate prices being so low when you compare it to a place like San Francisco where the rents and the housing and office space, I wonder if you could talk a little about how Detroit could be part of the Made in America. I heard a great NPR segment in May or June on uh, maybe you can speak to some of the companies that are, are startups. They're very creative, and they can afford to be there, and they can manufacture in America, in Detroit. And, and they are socially, the, the, I wish I could pull up the NPR link. There was a company, it might have been in Tech Town, making clothing. The women, the, the women in the neighborhood, the mothers, homeless. could leave for daycare. They had daycare there. It was a whole, it was, re, it was a fantastic social company as well. So maybe you could talk about the new Made in America possibilities for Detroit. So I, I think that's a beautiful question, something we spend a lot of time on. And we've had a, a kind of an organic and authentic outgrowth in the maker spaces and hacker spaces for people who want to make things. I mean, we're makers. We literally build things. That's what we do. And a return to that is kind of critical to our psyche. And so you've seen these kind of early adopters trying to bring that back. And what Tech Town and our partners are trying to do is figure out how do we really formalize that in enterprise creation that goes beyond that kind of hacker movement to creating sustainable businesses. And so we're doing that in food process some kind of small lot food processing, you know, connecting the urban gardening opportunities to the manufacturing opportunities. We're starting to see um, some textile development, so clothing being made in the city, which is kind of a return to a, a past capacity. And then we're also starting to look at some of the opportunities within the automotive industry, which sounds a bit like sacrilege, but that's where we grew up, right? And so are there innovations in technology, electronics, and other component parts? that can easily be made in sleeping factories that answer a question that's being asked by local industries. So one really interesting uh, fact, $600 million of electronic component parts are shipped into Detroit on an annual basis to the automotive companies. And we are trying to figure out how do we create that product development within the city such that we're not buying that from somewhere else because we make stuff better than anyone else. And so we are starting to really build out the second and third layers of that plan and know that it's critical, especially in these neighborhoods, because the, the economic uh, benefits of manufacturing jobs are exponentially higher than jobs in just about any other industry, especially middle class jobs. And so when you look at the workforce and connecting that workforce to the asset base, Manufacturing jobs are really highly productive in terms of the, uh, the exponential impact they have on the economy. So great question, and yes, we think about it every day. And we've seen this whole question of the low property values um, as well. I mean, while you don't have low properties as much in the Midtown Downtown Corridor, clearly in the neighborhoods mm -hmm. you can pick up fantastic houses for you know, an unbelievable amount of money. And I mean, this has brought in a lot of folks from other cities across the country that just cannot believe that you can buy homes of the quality that you can buy in Detroit in some of these neighborhoods for the pricing. And I, you know, lots of stories. I mean, I have someone who came to work for me who was doing consulting in Detroit, never planned to move to Detroit, and one day happened to be driving down Boston Boulevard in Detroit, saw a house he wanted, and that was it. He moved here overnight, called his wife, we're moving to Detroit. They moved in a couple of weeks, and that was that. I mean, so there are a lot of people who these homes and the values are enough to actually bring them to Detroit. We're also making nice watches in Detroit. Making now, the yes. Shinola watches <laughs> in Detroit. And, you know, again, these are folks coming in that are hiring Detroiters training and hiring Detroiters to make bikes and watches, leather products. 
uh, a lot of small batch manufacturing and processing, um, lots of that going on. And again, you can pick up a warehouse and f open your own production facility for like 200,000 in some of these neighborhoods or less. So, I mean, it makes it for a young uh, uh, entrepreneur, even for an older one, it makes it um, work. Uh, if you only have so much capital, but you really want to do something that you've always uh, had a passion for and you want to do it in a city that's important to America and you want to help rebuild. Yeah, look, I mean, it's, the, the bottom line is Detroit has brand equity that you just can't buy, right? I mean, when you're talking about uh, artisanal manufacturing in particular, um, and you want that association with sort of muscular, authentic manufacturing, uh, you know, Detroit, Detroit is your go-to place. I'd say San Francisco. There's a few other places in the, in the country that have that sort of uh, resonance. Um, but Detroit certainly has a sort of positional advantage there. Uh, let's go. I think, where's the mic now? Okay, right here. Yep. Uh, it seems like a lot of these initiatives are focused on bringing people with money back into the city, which is obviously an important part of creating a tax base and creating customers for small businesses. I was wondering what can be done to address the skills gap of adults who need jobs but are currently excluded from the technology economy and also exposing children to things like computer engineering, software programming so that they can participate in the future and gain interest in things that can give them a job in the future. That's a great question. So how, how, do, we, how do we include folks in, in, in the economy that, that you know, we're, we're constructing here? And, and how do we also make sure that we're constructing an economy that is inclusive, right? That, that creates opportunities for a variety of people. Um, there's a couple of, you know, pretty robust program, I say, on the science and engineering side for youth. Uh, we have a very large science and math um, accelerator school in our neighborhood. Uh, that clearly is all, you know, about trying to get kids um, to go on to careers in science and, and math and engineering. Um, there's also a huge, I think now the state of Michigan and Detroit has a gigantic robotics program for high school kids. I mean, I think, one, I think that state's the largest in the country now with number of teens. And I mean, so there's a very big, again, that goes back to that engineering base, that maker culture we have in Detroit. So, I mean, there is a lot of work, I think, going on in city schools around some of that on the youth. I think it's a much bigger challenge and much less scalable work is being done for the unemployed and chronically unemployed, low-skilled, population, which is the largest bucket of unemployed in Detroit. And, um, you know, we started a workforce program with Henry Ford Hospital, a huge medical system that hires 4,000 people a year. And they've now carved out numerous job categories where low-skilled folks can get in and then they, then they get them into the programs where they train them up job categories. And so clearly in healthcare, that's a pretty established model that they find works. And so in our area with two major healthcare, I mean, we're at least trying to do that. Uh, and then you have some of these manufacturers coming in, investing a lot in training folks on assembly work and manufacturing kind of work. And so there is some of that coming back, but it's still next to the numbers of people who are unemployed, it's a drop um, in the bucket really. Yeah, I mean, we have some, the Automation Alley, who's one of our regional partners, does similar training for technology jobs, um, kind of by industry. They'll train folks to kind of close that gap, and they do it in three to six months, so there's proximity to um, employment. It is a huge problem. The, the youth are easier to engage and kind of redeploy uh, and change their modeling and their, and their prospects. We're uh, introducing entrepreneurship in the high schools in each of the communities where we work with our SWAT city programming to build a pipeline. How we solve the, you know, generationally unemployed, though, is a larger kind of societal challenge that I think we're going to spend a couple decades trying to unpack. Okay, one more quick question back here with the mic and one pithy answer and then we're done. <laughs> Okay, I'll make this fast. My name is Angela Barbash. I'm with Reconsider. I'm actually in Ypsilanti, which is a suburb of Detroit. We're involved in the local investing movement. And to your point about uh, less than 10% of the businesses are owned by Detroiters and, and African-American Detroiters and, you know, 83% of the population are African-American and that skills gap. Uh, if someone, say, wants to open a dry cleaner, and if they find an SBTDC office to get technical assistance, and, and if they, they stumble upon these resources, and then they need the capital, 
What we often hear is that they're just not fundable because they're a lifestyle business. But it's those kinds of businesses that will attract you know, everybody from the suburbs back in to start the larger businesses because they'll have all the support services. So are you seeing innovations in capital sources? Mm -hmm. Because the community banks won't touch them. The VCs and angels won't touch them. We, you know, our solution is, okay, well, local people have capital in IRAs that want to invest in the dry cleaner, and can we make that happen? So that's what we're working on. But what are you guys seeing in Detroit that maybe we're not seeing yet? Yeah, I mean, that's a huge challenge for us because many of the businesses we start or support are exactly those businesses that you're talking about. And we've, um, you know, come up with some creative solutions. Kiva Detroit is extraordinarily active in the micro lending space and is a powerful partner in that work. We have three other micro lenders who will work with us directly to understand what fundable means. But we're also creating long-term pathways to fundability. So we don't suggest that this micro loan is the last step, and we make sure that we're building bankable companies at the beginning who are not bankable when we start with them, but we hope over the intervening five or seven years they will be. In the interim, though, all of these creative kind of innovation, you know, platforms around crowdsourcing and micro lending are really answering the questions. And you're seeing a whole host of different people getting funding those models, but it's working for us. The investment that that dry cleaner needs in terms of capital is so small mm -hmm. that if you're just creative about finding 25 to 5,000, 2,500 to 5,000 bucks, you've just launched a business. Um, we have a couple of funds that are established for the corridor, a retail fund, two actually, and they're critical. I mean, nobody would be funded if they don't fund those higher risk businesses, and they're not ones that micro loans will work for. They need fifty to three to four hundred thousand dollars to get those businesses going. So, you know, finding capital sources through, uh, you know, um, CDFI partners or other kinds of state partnerships for funding I think are going to be critical to getting off the ground any significant number of these types of lifestyle businesses. We've had 24 open in our neighborhood in the last year and then another 12 in build out and pretty much all of them have been funded by these couple of funders um, along with funding that we brought in on the capital side with NCB and others to actually pay for the build out costs of a lot of these spaces. Um, and we've also subsidized the cost on that end for a lot of the small businesses to actually get up and running. So there's a really robust capital uh, play to make these kinds of businesses, I think, get up and going. Well, based on the, the quality of those questions, I mean, clearly we could continue to have this conversation for quite a while here. They're great questions. Uh, unfortunately, our time is up, but I, I've really enjoyed this. I want to thank our panelists for sharing their thoughts with us. And, uh, and, and thank you all for, for spending time with us. And uh, you know, come to Detroit, check us out, and spend some time with us, <laughs> some more time with us. And, and we look forward to seeing you at some point, all of you there. So take care. Thanks. Good afternoon.